Test one, two, three. First of all, thank you so much, Neil and Rhonda, for doing this. I mean, yeah. And again, before I start telling my lies, I'd like to recognize, first of all, any veteran. Would you please stand up and be recognized? A veteran of any service, any time, any place. Thank you. And Vietnam veterans. Vietnam veterans, if you'd remain standing. Okay. Welcome home, brothers. Good to have you back. Okay. Thanks. And where's Bob Carlson? I hear he's here. Where'd he go? He's still okay. buying trinkets around the corner. Well, he's spending money, Neil. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I've got a collection of slides here that I'm going to show you that really represent not so much my story, but your story as A1 drivers. And uh, also, I was asked by Don Engerbritsen to put in the story a little bit of uh, Heavy Hook, Prairie Fire, and the SOG mission, basically, uh, Studies and Observation Group, Special Forces Vietnam, and how that tied into the war over the trail. So we're going to have some of that as well. I'm going to rip through my slides as fast as I can, and then I'm going to open the floor to questions, obviously. Then I'm going to let some of my brothers in arms have at it and, uh, and tell you even more lies. So welcome. Glad you're here. <clears throat> you know, we took very little photographs while we were there because we were young and dumb and we flew and drank, and that's about what we did. <laughs> and uh, I, I really didn't even have a camera. So most of the photographs that are in here come from the excellent website that uh, Hook Huckey, one of our great guys, did that he put together on the I-1 Scout Raider, you know Hook. And uh, it's a massive collection of A-1 stuff. Is that Carlson coming in? Hey, Bob Goldie. <laughs> Hadn't seen you in 50 years, bro. All right. Bob. I heard you're here. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Uh, the rest of the photographs, basically, some are mine, some come from friends from uh, Hot Blood. I'm asking uh, Leroy, basically, to give me some, but the majority of them come from the Internet. Why? Because, again, we didn't take pictures. It wasn't part of what we did, at least I didn't. And the other thing is many of the missions that we flew were top secret, many of them in the black program, many involved with the CIA, so we just didn't record things and were told not to do so. Well, I had an interesting tour. I got to fly two airplanes, both the OV-10 Bronco, there's one out in the, in the front there, and the I -1, A-1 Sky Raider. I feel really fortunate because in my 73rd year, I'm still flying and I fly a lot. I instruct and give type ratings in DC-3, C-47s, fly T-28 and a bunch of old airplanes, and uh, I'm delighted that I'm still able to do that. I have a business in aviation, as, ne as Neil said. Polyfiber aircraft coatings, we essentially do paint, primers, coatings, and skins for antique and classic airplanes and warbirds, and we basically paint most of them and develop custom colors and do what we need to do. The, T, the two C-47s in D-Day livery on the bottom of the screen here, uh, I put up just to remind you that in three weeks, I'm going to have the opportunity to fly a DC-3 C-47. Uh, over the 75th anniversary in Normandy, we're taking our airplanes to Normandy. We're going to drop out about 400 round canopy parachuters over the beaches wow. of D-Day. And then we go on from that to do uh, the reenactment of the Berlin airlift. So I'm, I'm happy to still be flying. I was held prisoner for a while as an airline pilot. That didn't take. <laughs> I worked for Delta Airlines, a fine company, but I wasn't much of an airline pilot. My Air Force career ended up in the F-15. I was a squadron commander of the 71st TAC Fighter Squadron, which was a great honor. I also was an aggressor in F-5s, a European aggressor in the air-to-air -air mission. Uh, that's me on the right-hand side. I flew F-111s in the strike mission in Europe as well. And there I am looking very stupid, as usual. I was a T-38 instructor uh, after I got back from, from uh, Vietnam. I grew up in general aviation. I worked my way basically into flying by being a line boy. Here I am at age 16. By the time I was 18, I'm the executive with the tie on there. 18 years old, teaching people to fly. If you think that wasn't scary, I mean, not for me, for the students. Motivated by the draft, I wound up uh, in the Air Force, went to pilot training in 1969. Got my wings, very proud of that. You know, we all had our choices to make. I graduated in such a place that I got my first choice, which was an A-1 Sky Raider. Why? 
I uh, turned down several single seat jet fighters and other jet fighters to be able to fly the Sky Raider because I've always been an avid fan of World War II history and figured this was my last shot at it. So I took the Sky Raider and was delighted to get it. Okay, here I am in Sky Raider school. Uh, I do have a question for you though. Libby, if you'll stand up, please. Stand up, Libby. Stand up. Turn around and face the crowd. All right, this is a quiz. Levy Rents is in this photograph. Where in the hell is he? That's right. He's a guy to my left. That's Levy. We were classmates together in the A1. You look, you look exactly the same, too, except for the mustache. That's good. I got that bit Okay. All right, well, uh, with the usual uh, way that things proceed in the United States Air Force, uh, it was decided soon after my class graduated that uh, lieutenants were too inept to fly the A-1 Sky Raider, and so they threw us all out. And basically, everybody that had gone through Sky Raider school that was a recent graduate of pilot training was summarily executed or thrown out, and uh, I wound up trying to get another airplane. Got an OV-10 Bronco, uh, also at Herbert Field, went through school there. And after that, I had my choice of where I wanted to go as a forward air controller in the Air Force, so I chose Nakhon Phnom, Thailand, in KP, which is the same location of where the A-1 Sky Raiders were. Why? Well, again, I, I knew most of the guys that I'd gone through A-1 school with, and I also thought, maybe there's a glimmer of hope of being able to fly the Sky Raider again, so off I went. 24 years old, 1970, here I am reporting for duty as a nail fact. Let's talk about the OB-10 just for a minute. If you're not familiar with it. Twin turboprop engines, a very good airplane, carried a lot of stuff, believe it or not, mostly fuel, and was used primarily for the forward air control role for the United States Air Force. 147 were built for the Air Force. There were smaller numbers built for both the Navy and the Marine Corps. Both Navy and Marine Corps used them in combat as active counter air support airplanes. A picture of one from the Air Force Museum. Uh, this is exactly the way it was configured by the nail facts in uh, NKP. 300 gallon centerline tank, four machine guns and those little sponsons off the bottom of the fuselage, and four basic uh, LAU 59 rocket pods underneath that. The rocket pods were for smoke or for HE. Well, it was a very highly technical airplane. Uh, no GPS, no INS, no nav systems, no nothing. So we had a tack in in it, that was it. Uh, worked very well, however. <clears throat> Round instruments, switches, there was nothing digitized in an airplane of that era whatsoever. All right, so at NKP, the majority of the air war, and many of my cohorts here today who fought it, we fought our air war in the country of Laos. Now, if you're going to film Jurassic Park again, <laughs> Laos would be a good place, all right? It's nothing but triple canopy jungle. High karst mountains, as you can see here, waterfalls, high mesas, no roads, no cities, no people, no nothing. I mean, it was basically crude. That's what you can say about at Laos. A couple of pictures of what it looks like. It looked like this in 1970. It looks like this today. Nothing has changed in Laos, okay? There was no infrastructure, no paved roads, no railroads, no freeways, only dirt roads and low water crossings. Not a bridge in the place to speak of, okay? So why were we in such a place? I mean, everybody thinks, well, you were in Vietnam, you obviously went to North Vietnam, you did a lot of work in South Vietnam. Not so much in my time frame. In my time frame, the entire air war was fought over Laos. Why? Because that was the home of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Now, when I say Ho Chi Minh Trail, to most people, they think of the Appalachian Trail. Ah, oh, some happy backpackers walking along the road, you know? It's a trail, it's a trail in the jungle. It was a massive infrastructure of dirt roads, and other things to support the trucking of supplies from Hanoi all the way down to South Vietnam for the air war, or to support the ground war in South Vietnam. Now at that time, politically, uh, Russian and Warsaw Pact ships could sail right into Haiphong Harbor, take off the war materials to support the war against the Americans in the south. They were loaded into trucks. Little problem, the uh, North Vietnamese couldn't drive it across the DMZ and down into South Vietnam. If you take a look at this map, you'll see that North Vietnam and South Vietnam are the green portions of it. Uh, off to the uh, left-hand side, the tan portion is the country of Laos and beyond that, Thailand. And the red lines represent the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which basically turned right uh, directly into Laos, where they went into the neutral country of Laos with virtually no government, 
know nothing, and they built this massive Ho Chi Minh Trail infrastructure that went down there. Then they turned left and went through the passes in the Amite Mountains directly into South Vietnam where they would deliver the goods. To that end, we built all kinds of Air Force bases there. These are the majority ones in Vietnam. We built six of them in Thailand. The one we served at in the Con Phanom is right there on the banks of the Mekong River, very close to the Ho Chi Minh Trail and North Vietnam. That's why it was there. How close? Uh, well, it was, uh, I, I would say it was about 90 nautical miles to the heart of the trail, probably, and maybe 200 nautical miles into the heart of Vietnam. You agree with me, guys? Oh, Roughly that. So close run. Ho Chi Minh Trail was 700 miles long, and again, it was a parallel series of roads, dirt tracks, and trails, highly organized, broken up into 15-mile segments, okay? There were at least 3,000 trucks on the trail at one time. Now, we didn't know this when we were there. Nobody told us a lot about it. We just kind of went to work every day, and it's taken me a long time to piece a lot of this history together and exactly how it worked. But that's what the intel guys say, about 3,000 trucks on that trail every day and every night. The trucks drove at night, obviously, they're not going to drive in the height of the daylight where we could see them and bomb them. And at night they'd hunker down into camouflage places and spider holes where the, uh, where the drivers would go to protect themselves from the bombing. The segments were called bintroms. A driver would drive only one bintrom. So he would drive 10 to 15 miles a night, and then he'd be deadheaded back to the top, pick up another truck, and drive the same one. So he knew every square inch of that trail and he could drive it without lights, knew where all the hidey holes were, knew what to do when we started wreaking death and destruction on his head. <clears throat> lots of bulldozers for repairs, lots of dedicated people that kept that cargo moving. When we would take out a low water crossing, or in this case, a temporary bridge, that same night, they just bypass it. There you go, they get the bulldozers out, and the next day, off they go again. At nighttime, they would monitor our radios. They had all of our strike frequencies on there. We weren't too bright about that. They'd monitor the radios. They had a series of red and green lights in the entire root structure of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And the minute they heard that uh, a shark bait flight was coming in to ban the boy and was going to work with a fac out there, they'd turn on the red lights. The trucks would stop and dive into, into hidey holes, and that's how they survived. These are contemporary pictures of the trail, which I'll show you some more, but basically complete fuel uh, pipeline that ran down the whole thing and fuel storage tanks in a cave. So they didn't have to worry about POL. They had all the gasoline they needed, and it was a highly organized root structure, which we didn't really know that much about, quite frankly. Okay? And as you can imagine, North Vietnamese wanted to protect these assets, which they did through Russian guided uh, uh, missiles, essentially the same structure and radar operated big guns. So the opposition to us when we try to bomb the trucks on the trail, I could say was savage at best. All right. So how do we prosecute the air war against the thing? Well, here's an F-4 doing its thing. I want to remind you of a couple of numbers that I picked up, and these are absolutely true because I got them off the internet. Okay. <laughs> Central Germany, 9,088 millimeter anti-aircraft guns protected the Berlin and up through Central Germany in World War II. The trail had over 10,000 23, 87, 85 radar ZPU force. There were a lot of guns on that trail, more than in Central Germany in World War II. World War II, we dropped 4.3 million tons of bombs total in World War II. That's a lot of bombs. So how many we drop on the Ho Chi Minh Trail? three million tons of bombs, okay? And for those of you that were there, you know we dropped a lot of bombs. These are pictures taken of the Ho Chi Minh root structure from about 5,000 feet. You'll see the green foliage in the background. The tan part is where we've completely blown the jungle away. It's nothing but craters, sand pits, and what remains. To the right, that F-4 is over Bay and Boy, the dog's head, for those of you who remember that. Uh, the McNamara, uh, yeah, I'll call them administration, but the DOD under McNamara decided that the way to handle the Ho Chi Minh Trail was to pick out certain choke points and to bomb those choke points once a day, once a night, every day, and just bomb them into impurity. Well, you know, if you're any kind of farmer at all, you know, when you bomb a dirt road, you know, you're making more building materials, essentially, right? But that's what they did, day and night, day and night, day and night on interdiction points, Alpha Box, Bravo Box, Charlie Box, Ban Le Boy, Ban Ravine, Ban Phenob, you guys know them, okay? 
The only problem was, if we went to the same place every day to bomb dirt roads, then General Jia, who was running the defense, simply concentrated his guns in those places. So they became more than dangerous, as you guys all remember. And again, another picture taken, this time about 3,000 feet, those are Karst Mountains. Uh, that's a river that's running through uh, one of the alpha boxes out there. Those are bomb craters. That's not the surface of the moon. That's what the boxes look like from the air, okay? Okay, the OB-10, this airplane was a key part of the war against the air because the OB-10 forward air controllers, unlike forward air controllers in South Vietnam, patrolled every square mile of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, all 700 miles, both day and night, looking for movers, guns, supply caches, and whatever. Now, to patrol this, we had to stay above 5,000 uh, AGL, and generally higher than that because they were shooting at us all the time. So we did most of our surveillance with binoculars, which was kind of fun. You'd hold the binoculars in this hand, you'd hold the stick with this hand, and you'd fly for four hours jinking and looking at the root structure, often while they're shooting at you through binoculars to try to figure out what the hell is down there. On the right-hand side is a poster, a North Vietnamese poster, uh, propaganda poster showing uh, the People's Army of North Vietnam with their guns shooting down an American aircraft. Okay. So how did we navigate up there? There were only three TACANs in country. Those TACANs were placed on top of mountaintops in Laos by helicopter, and some very brave souls would sit up there because this is bad guy territory. And about once every three months, the enemy would climb up the hill and blow it all away and have to do it again. So we didn't really have any aids to navigation. We used very detailed maps, and we used landmarks. So we all knew where the dog's head was, George's head, where the bra, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked to each other like, hey, I'm over here by dog's head. All right, I'm uh, 15 minutes out. I'll meet you there. And that's how we got around. We didn't have any GPS. We didn't do anything. We went everywhere based on landmarks, dead reckoning, and maps. What did the forward air controllers look for? Well, first thing you look for was any square angle. You know, in a jungle, there are no square angles. <laughs> so if you saw a square angle, it basically, and this is a very obvious one, this is a, a truck that has had its camouflage blown away and is about to get really its head handed to it. But uh, uh, you can see the difference in what it looks like by looking at a square angle. Other things we looked for were vegetable gardens. Okay? The North Vietnamese had to support their people not just by bringing rice down, but they grew vegetable plots in the sunlight because it's really hard to grow vegetables under triple canopy jungle. So they cleared jungle, put a vegetable patch up. When we saw the vegetable patches, we knew what was going on down there. So that gave us a pretty good hint to really look for a place where the North Vietnamese were encamped. On the low water crossings, for those Texans here who know what a low water crossing is, just a ford on the river, we would look for the splashes every night to see the pattern of the splashes from where the trucks had moved and the severity of the splash pattern to see how many trucks had gone down there, and then we'd go on. All right, once we found stuff, we'd call in fighter bombers, we'd put down smoke rockets so that they could uh, take out whatever we could find, and hopefully we'd kill as many trucks as we could in one day or one night. It's a picture of me over the Ho Chi Minh Trail taken by Ted Stuckey. Uh, I don't know what we were doing, taking pictures of each other, because he must have had a camera. Okay. Nikon Phnom Talon, it wasn't all terrible. I mean, this is kind of the daily routine. Uh, NKP, as those of you know that were there, uh, was located right on the Mekong River, across the river from Laos, which was bad guy territory, but Thailand was peaceful. You know, we never got attacked, we never had a problem, no big deal. 5,000 airmen were there. Uh, most of the airplanes there flew four plus hour missions, you know, every time we flew, which equated for me to about 60 combat hours per month, which is a lot of getting shot at. You know, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a lot of time to fly. Uh, and again, right across the river, this is a picture of a little stair step uh, with golden gates on it that would go down to the Mekong River and across the other side is the country of Laos with the Karst Mountains beyond. So we'd go down to the waterfront and drink beer and look over there and worry about what was going to happen tomorrow, but it didn't slow down our beer drinking whatsoever. Yeah. We partied a lot. That's me and Jimmy Lowe in party suits. You've seen a series of them here. Gabby was wearing cliffs yesterday. We all wore these funny little party suits. I don't know why, but it just made it look cool. Uh, I can still fit into my hat and my socks. And my <laughs> uh, when I was a nail fact, I was given a little pig to raise as a joke. Uh, the Air Force, and here the pig is getting bigger, so I got her a party suit as well. <laughs> Took that for a while. 
Uh, <laughs> the Air Force had a regulation that said that, uh, that squadrons could in fact have animal mascots as long as they were dogs, so this pig's name was I'm a dog. <laughs> we had some real characters uh, in, in the whole Air War, as you may know. This guy with the improbable name of Leonard J. Funderburg, Funderburg was nicknamed Thunder Chicken, a remarkable guy. He's from somewhere like Yazoo City, Mississippi. He was true Southern all the way through. Well, the chicken hated guns. We all hated guns, and we couldn't see the guns, even though I told you there were almost 10,000 of them out there. They were camouflaged and moving around every day. So it's not like you flew around and say, oh, there's a gun position, there's a gun position. We couldn't see them from our altitude, even as for our controller A1 drivers. We just saw them when they started shooting at us. Okay? So the Thunder Chicken had a brilliant idea about how to find guns. He would go down to treetop level okay, and look for gun barrels. This is not conducive to long life. Okay? And Chicken did this for almost six months, and after a while he got so successful. Now, he didn't tell any of the brass about what he was doing. He would just find a gun barrel, he'd climb back up to about 6,000 feet and say, Eureka, I've discovered a gun. <laughs> and uh, at that period of time, they would send in uh, one of the first of the laser-guided paveway bombs that would come in. They kept them specifically for Thunder Chicken for a long time to blow guns away. And uh, there's one of the big bombs. That's the result in the jungle where the gun was. Uh, Leonard J. Funderburg won the Air Force Cross as a first lieutenant for being an absolute madman. And he was the guy that destroyed most of the guns that were ever done in the Air War over the house. Interesting guy. Is he still living? Funderburg is still living. Yeah, he's somewhere out there. I think he runs a bar now. <laughs> All of you guys in the A1s know that the uh, Special Forces were highly involved with the, uh, with the mission in the Ho Chi Minh Trail, as was the Central Intelligence Agency, which we never really figured out, but in later years I really did. Okay? Again, the heavy triple canopy jungle was such that we couldn't see the trucks moving under the jungle during the daylight. So. Uh, we were largely thwarted by doing that, and then at night it was even worse. So they could drive fairly well with impunity under the trees. So some genius in the uh, government decided that we would come up with a great technology to find trucks under the triple canopy jungle. And the way they did that was they took U.S. Navy sauna buoys that they would drop to find uh, uh, submarines with, and they turned them into tree look-alike lawn darts, the best way I can describe it. And they were sensors that would pick up the sound of moving trucks, battery powered, and they would drop strings of these at low altitude out of F4s going very fast right down the root structure. So this would bounce a signal and take a recording of a truck moving by. They built a massive collection agency there at Netcom Phenomenal, as you remember Task Force Alpha. It was there just to record all this data and then to plot where we thought the trucks were. <laughs> Well, it's obvious you can't take a battery-powered sensor a hundred miles away, basically, and have it transmit a signal back to Task Force Alpha. So to do that, we had some guys who really had a great job. They would fly modified general aviation aircraft, Beach Bonanzas, called Q-22Bs, who would orbit at 20,000 feet over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, sucking on oxygen in a light plane, and act as a signal bounce from this thing to the airplane back to NKP. A really great job. You know, those guys read a lot of novels, and I think they drank heavily in the airplane. I'm not sure. <laughs> so the targets were plotted that they couldn't see in the jungle at Task Force Alpha, and they would readily identify for us where the base camps were, where the trucks were, where the movers were, and the whole thing. Rest stations, the only problem was we still couldn't see them. Okay? So we'd go up there and they'd say, we got a massive camp, and they'd give us lat longs and, you know, UTMs and People would bomb in there and you had no idea what you were doing. So the only way to replicate and figure out exactly what was going on was boots on the ground. And some of the bravest guys I ever ran into, and Mr. Hunter, are you out there today? He was here earlier. Special Forces guys from uh, MACP SOG who were recon runners who we would place on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to check out what was really going on. Right. So how did we get those guys on the trail? I mean, how, how did that all work? Well, first of all, there was a very an ultra top seed compound there on the on the NKP that most of us really knew the dirty little secret about. That was called Heavy Hook, and that was the home of these recon teams and the Max Sog teams that were going to be placed out on the Ho Chi Minh Trail on the ground to verify the intelligence and find out where the bad guys really were. 
Picture of Heavy Hook in 1969, all Special Forces guys. Okay. The recon teams that actually hit the ground were made up of American forces and little people, as we call them. These would be some South Vietnamese, some Hmong refugees, okay, Hmong uh, fighters that, uh, that worked out on uh, northern Laos, and many turncoats from the North Vietnamese who were called Kit Carters. <coughs> And these guys were recruited by the CIA. The CIA would work up the target base for where they wanted to verify targets. The recon teams were briefed by CIA, run by MAXOG, basically, on what happened, and they were put on the ground to do their thing. To help out in the insertion and the pulling of these teams, uh, they uh, designated six Air Force backs, and these were all chosen by the MAXOG guys, by the Special Forces teams to work directly with them to put the recon teams into the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Here's a band of idiots in 1971. The guy leaning back, smiling with a mustache, is me. And uh, these are all great friends of mine that were Prairie Fire Facts of 1971. Uh, the guy with the shock of blonde hair uh, on the extreme <coughs> right-hand side, Jimmy Latham was shot down as a prisoner for uh, four years. And Danny Thomas, who was my replacement, went to A1s, the little Cherub-faced fellow over here was killed in action as a prairie fire fact. So it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't a great job to have. It was a good job to have done. Right? And there we are again. That was a prairie fire team of that time. Is that the Hoot Gibson there? Uh, well, there's a lot of Hoot Gibsons. That's that's the Special Forces Hoot Gibson guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. So anyway, once we were chosen as prairie fire facts, we quit hunting uh, trucks on the road, and our mission was to insert these recon teams. So we would work up with uh, special forces guys in our back seats that were called cubby riders. We'd go out for about a month, work the target up. The CIA would tell us what the mission was. The missions were either surveillance, or and sometimes, this is my favorite, prisoner snatches, okay? So these guys would go down on the ground, think about it, run around, go down to a base camp where the North Vietnamese would have, North Vietnamese may have four or 5,000 guys sleeping in a base camp. They'd sneaky Pete into the camp, and steal one of the guys and bring him back, hog time, bring him back and take him back to NKP for interrogation. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> uh, here's one of the Covey riders getting ready to go out. There's Jim Latham and Gary Robb getting ready. So when we put the team in, and now we're bringing the A-1 into the mix, I mean, we put the team in with a CH-53 helicopter, uh, always escorted by two or four A-1s because they were the only reliable escort done that and the Prairie Fire FAC would lead the whole package into the infill, uh, show the CH-53 where to go, then everybody would sit there and see what happened, okay? Uh, the little blip on the middle of the screen there in white is me and an OV-10 leading a mission into an LZ, and again, there's the package going out there. On board a CH-53, that's Recon Team Alaska, getting ready to be put down for prisoner snatch. <coughs> and they'd hit the ground, off they'd go. That's a picture of them in the elephant grass from the helicopter looking down in the prop wash. Uh, these are taken by Mike Taylor. These particular pictures, Mike Taylor, who was a heavy hook uh, 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 guy out of NKP that we all know very well. Okay. Another infill with the team running away from it. Sometimes you couldn't land, so we'd put them down on a ladder or on a big string. It was not the most brilliant of all ideas. Then as a prairie fire fact, I'd get away, find to about 10,000 feet, move, stand off about 15 miles, come up HF radio and talk to the team leader while he's walking around to see if we needed to pull him out or not. Sometimes their missions were highly successful. They could walk around completely self-sustaining for up to about four to five days. Then they'd run out of ammunition and beans and bacon, and we'd have to take them out. Uh, most of the time, however, all hell would break loose, you know. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> You put down a, a, a small team of Special Forces guys on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, that sounds like a good outcome. It was rarely a good outcome. And when that happened, we declare a prairie fire emergency. You guys know what this was, where every air asset in Southeast Asia would come to try to get that team up and out of there. Sometimes you had to take them out on a string because you couldn't land the helicopter. There's another bunch of them coming out on a string. And really, they weren't climbing into the helicopter. They'd just hook onto the string, and the helicopter would drag them 15 miles away where they could land and get them in the helicopter. The helicopter didn't like that aerodynamically either, particularly at high disk. A little drag. OK, 147 OV-10s in the Air Force. 64 were lost. 
almost all of them in Laos. Okay? Didn't lose many of them in country or anywhere else, but almost all of them in Laos. Meanwhile, back in the A1 world, remember I told you at the start that they cut off the pipeline for uh, recent graduates of pilot training going into the A1. So guess what? They ran out of pilots. <laughs> So while I was finishing up my tour as a prairie fire back in the OB-10, the word went out that anybody who had recently flown the A-1 was welcome to come back and join the 1st Special Operations Squadron, the last remaining squadron, the Hobos at NKP. And of course, I was right there on station and had been drinking with my bros for a whole year. So me and Johnny Ralston and Snip White went back. Here I am in a squadron picture in uh, 1971 back in the A-1 first SOS hobo. So now I'm embarking on my second tour uh, on A1s, okay? And there I am in full A1 flying gear. The A1 was the last of the prop driven fighter bombers, as we all know. I mean, 8,000 pounds of ordnance. Think about that. A B-17 going to Berlin with 12 souls on board could carry 5,000 pounds of ordnance. An A1 could carry easily 8,000 pounds of ordnance and loiter with it until we ran out of oil, rarely gas. Okay. <laughs> it was built as the replacement for the Douglas Dauntless at the end of World War II. Didn't make it there. They built over 3,000 of them in El Segundo of all models. It served with great distinction in Korea, as we know. Between the Korean War and the Vietnamese War, it went into the hunter-killer concept, searching for Soviet uh, submarines, basically. So what we call the fat faces, the 85s essentially, the blue room in the back was full of Sonobui operators where they dropped the Sonobuis and listened for subs. On his wing would be two killers, uh, single seats, H's, J's we call them. They would carry the torpedoes and the bomb or the mines and the bombs and whatever is necessary to try to blow up submarines. <coughs> Navy then obviously carried him forward into Vietnam where they served with distinction. Eventually the Navy decided they didn't want any more property of an airplane so they phased it out. Uh, before that, however, it had a reputation for carrying anything. I want you to look carefully at this. Oh. <laughs> USS Enterprise, for a joke, took a toilet and dropped it on North Vietnam. So. <laughs> the only one they had in North Vietnam. Yeah. The only toilet in North Vietnam. <laughs> Slight damage upon delivery, but other than that, no problem. Okay. Uh, the Navy actually shot down a MiG-17. Uh, Hartman and Johnson, two guys in there, actually gunned one. And this was not a fluke thing. This was a true air-to-air -air combat where they outturned them, outflew them, and shot them in the face and shot them down. So the A-1 was wow. pretty good for that. The Air Force recognized when the Navy phased them out that this would be a great counterinsurgency airplane. So we started picking them up and training South Vietnamese troops to fly them. Air Commandos in, Viet in, uh, in uh, 1964, Benoit. Here's a South Vietnamese uh, uh, A-1, basically, with the distinctive checkerboard tail on the back. But after doing this for a year or so, the Air Force recognized that the airplane was really capable. And we were kind of wasting our time just giving them to the South Vietnamese. Why don't we start our own A-1 squadrons of U.S. Air Force people alone, which they did. No longer worry advisors. Okay, so what happened was over the years they were used uh, with great utility in South Vietnam, but it really morphed into its primary role, which was a search and rescue, the SAR mission. The ability to go out and pick up a shot down U.S. American airmen, either U.S. Air Force, Navy, or Marine Corps. And as we know, shoot downs were commonplace in, uh, in the Vietnamese War. A lot of American shoot downs, a whole bunch. The CH-53 had every capability going out along with its predecessor, the CH-3, with an escort of A-1s to find out where the shot down airman was, identify what needed to be done, pick him up, and defend his pickup in the jungle by making sure he lived by getting out. And there's what became known as a Sandy package. We picked up a call sign of Sandys, and we were specifically on the SAR roll. Okay. And the reason it worked so good is because the A-1 and the CH-53 could fly a long time, low and slow, identify where the survivor was and get him out. This is a lovely picture painted by Stan Stokes. It is Neil of 665, okay, which you may have never seen before. Stan uh, painted it for me as a gift. We're very good friends. And uh, this is not historically correct, but he put my name on the canopy railer, but it is of 665. 
and it shows a picture of, uh, of what a star really looked like. If you can imagine, there's the Jolly Green Giant hovering over the smoke that the survivor has put out once he had been identified and found by the Sandy Low lead. Then the rest of us went up and got into a big daisy chain orbit of putting down hell and destruction around the survivor when the Jolly went in and picked him up and got him out of there. So it's a pretty good depiction of what a star really looked like. Okay. Weapons panel we call the Wurlitzer. It was the most uh, unfamiliar and worst weapons panel of any airplane ever flew. You know, to drop anything, you had to look down and make about 10 weapon switches and then look back up and not hit that tree. It wasn't good. Here's a sandy load that we would use when we used uh, mostly on search and rescues. Note, not a lot of bombs. In fact, no bombs except for one signal, the Willie, Willie Phosphorus marking bomb. No bombs, no napalm, nothing like that. Because we had to have ordnance that we could lay down right next to a surviving airman who was about to be killed by the North Vietnamese who wanted to overrun him and get him. So the A1 could lay that down with deadly accuracy, I must say. And uh, the first thing that we used were our 420 millimeter cannon that were built into the thing, 200 rounds per gun, 10 second fire time. We also had a little Gatling gun, 7.62. This was highly valuable in a high dive because uh, you could hurt a lot of people, not with the bullets, but the shell casing could hit him on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty small little slug, didn't do much good, but made a lot of noise. Okay. Rocket pods, we had two kinds, seven shots and 19 shots. Uh, carried a lot of rockets, very accurate as well. And then uh, cluster bombs, little, little round circles of death that would roll out of the bottom of these tubes. This is CBU-24 and Su-14 dispensers. Each one of those big dispenser units had 132 of these bombs of death. There were 22 per tube. They would come spilling out of the back end. We'd drop them at anywhere from 25 feet to 200 feet you know, over the trees right next to the guy, and you could lay it down right next to him and not hurt him, hopefully, and, and hurt a lot of people trying to get to him. Uh, we sat alert not only in the Confinam, but at, Bena at Da Nang, sometimes Udorn, sometimes Benoit. This is me getting ready to go out as a sandy load out of Da Nang, and here he is. Wave at him, hot blood. This is, this is hot blood looking very macho giving last-minute directions to his, to his wingman, like, is the beer cold? Or, I don't know what you're saying. I'll be right back. Hold my beer. So uh, there's Young Blood doing that. This is after the mission. Uh, this particular one, Hot Blood tells me this was for Gunfighter 8-2. He got them both, and he's sitting there with his crew chief, uh, rightfully feeling very satisfied having just saved two lives. So an A1 starting up, that's what they look like, okay? My favorite picture of an A1, okay? Now, Neil, even though I gave you lots of paint and I see look all of this. them, all of the airplanes that go to the air shows, when I think of A1s, I think of this, yeah. okay? Yeah. Greasy, dirty, paint chips, ugly, you know, nothing. Didn't look anything like what you see at air shows. That's what an A, that's what an A1 looked like. And you could really tell A1 pilots because in our old gray K2B flight suits, they were irrevocably stained by oil and grease, which we could never get out, okay? And our only saver was when they gave us a, uh, a dark green Nomex flight suit, so it didn't stain that badly. But here again is another lovely A1. Fat face, some random pictures. Now, 665. Proof positive that Roger Youngblood flew 665. There he is. He sat alert with it. You can see the, uh, the number on it sitting right there. And here is an excerpt from my logbook. I kept a logbook the entire time that I was there. I put down every tail number, what we did, and the whole thing. Uh, this shows that on the 9th and 11th of September, I flew 665, first mission 2.4, second 3.0. Uh, I was flying with hot blood. I don't know who led and who won, but you know, whatever. And uh, in the missions, the first thing was a SAR for somebody called Eagle Yellow, and I called it a mini-SAR, and I don't remember it, so it must not have been much of a SAR. The second one, we worked with Raven 3-1 coming back for a truck part storage area. This is by reading my notes in my logbook. And uh, we got two trucks destroyed and two secondary fires is what it says. So here's a picture of Hot Blood and I standing in front of 665 at Denae. Well, okay. Well, you pissed at More pictures. The NKP flight line. 
here's a jackass eating briars. <laughs> The scarf. Okay, Ken, I saw your scarf today. That was hot. Okay. But here's the deal. When, I, mean, I don't remember exactly when, but C.V. Miller, who was our flight commander, and uh, Leroy and Hot Blood, and Bob, I don't think C.V. was your... But in any case, we were all squadron mates. We had the same flight commander. The tradition was that when you became mission ready, when you were all checked out, you are going to be an A-1 pilot, they would give you this long ceremonial scarf, okay? About eight feet long. Our, our flight, as I recall, was yellow, and they gave me this long yellow scarf. Okay, Goalie, we're going to go. We're going over to Da Nang, all four of us. Here's the deal. Uh, make sure this scarf is really tight around your neck, and uh, we're going to go over there. We get to initial, I'll give you the uh, canopy back signal, we throw the canopies back, I'll give you a head knot, we all throw our scarves out. The F4 guys will be completely oh. envious when they see our scarves flapping. <laughs> okay, got it, got it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm number four and I've got this scarf on really good and we come up and man, we're in echelon and I'm somebody and roll the canopy back. <laughs> 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 Well, that was a big joke, you know, I mean, and they did that to all new guys. Oh, you didn't no. tie it around your neck, you tied it to the, to the rail, the ejection rail behind you. <coughs> but they wanted, they wanted to make a point, so I got it, here we go. And Ken, I hope you're not tying it around your neck, huh? Okay, you're strapped, that's good. That'll be good. Can't say enough about the ground crews and, uh, and the enlisted folks who work for us. We would sit alert with uh, a gun plumber, usually an engine guy, an aircraft general guy in places like Da Nang and other things. When it came time to change an engine, which we had to do in those locations, they'd fly an engine to us. They'd give uh, the two pilots uh, really the speed handles and tell them to start undoing things because that was about the, the only skill we had. And we'd work as a team to change an engine out together, pilots and mechanics, till we got it back in the air. Nobody cared about crew rest or anything else. Okay. There I am looking very macho. So one day I go out to the airplane, and I'm a flight lead. I don't remember who I was flying with. And I see this really strange load on the airplane. I said, what the hell is that? I asked the crew chief. He says, you're asking me, sir? You're the pilot. I mean, I don't know what that is. And so I went back in. It's an M1A4 frag cluster. A what? Well, it looked to me like a whole bunch of hand grenades held together with a strap. You know. So I went in and asked the ops officer, what do I do is do I lay it down or dive it or what do you do with this? He says, hell, I don't know. <laughs> but make sure you drop it on bad guys. Okay, well, it looked like something that we had to lay down like napalm. So here's the results. <laughs> it was not something you laid down like napalm. <laughs> this actually was not my airplane, but it, it looked just exactly like that. I almost blew myself out of the sky. You know, we just didn't know any better. Uh, we crashed a lot of airplanes. These are from uh, Hook's website for the most part. Here's Mike Smith who landed gear up, if you remember that. Another guy on the runway at NKP with uh, uh, Pedro getting ready to drop the fire bottle right on him. Really brave guys. That's a fire extinguisher that you carry underneath the helicopter. So an A-1 full of gas, uh, any airplane full of gas or full of ordnance which crashed on the runway, what would they do? They would hover directly over it. Oh. The fire of the fire bottle to give the guy enough time to try to get out with that burning up. Okay. Pedro was her call sign. Jink Bender before me, they called him Jink because he didn't know how to jink very well, obviously. <laughs> oh my god. We did have an ejection seat, it was put in as an afterthought called a Yankee seat. Uh, and sometimes it even worked. Uh, it actually was a spin-stabilized rocket that was mounted, again, as an afterthought, directly behind the pilot's head. That's what you're looking at here. And when you pull the handle, what would happen is the rocket would stand up and fire like a Fourth of July fireworks, and it was attached to two giant bungee cords, which would then pull your parachute out, followed by a guy going... <laughs> and pull you out, force deploy the parachute, and supposedly it worked. So here's the pictures right out of our dash one of the rocket coming up and the poor guy getting lifted out of the airplane. So what could go wrong, you know? Nothing. And if for some reason it didn't fire, they gave you these simple procedures. There's six very complex strap uh, systems of pull this, undo that, do this, don't get this out of sequence, and then you can jump over the side. So uh, it worked sometimes, sometimes it didn't. 
A crew chief's log that was on Hook's website of the 1967 time period when they had an inordinate amount of losses, every one of those red stars is an airplane that was shot down, and this is about a two-month period. Other ones were transferred, that means they went to the South Vietnam, or they may have been moved around, but that's kind of the loss rate that you saw. Nikon Phnom, this is how we lived. We lived in long, uh, <coughs> teak buildings, two men to a room. We had a great party hooch in the middle, which we would do a lot of partying at. My roommate, uh, Johnny Ralston, who we're going to see at Oshkosh this year, we lived together, all of us were two to a room. Here's what you do when you're not flying, you drink beer and you do what baseball players do. So. <laughs> party hooch, that's Johnny Ralston. That's uh, Money Play in the background. And, uh, and our hero, yeah, Jim Love, and our hero, Youngblood, who's got his name tag on upside down so he can read it when he gets drunk and know what his name was. Is that right? <laughs> there he is. Uh, there's Lee Green and the rest of us. We decorated our, uh, Lee Green was a very popular intelligence officer, a beautiful girl, very smart. And uh, she was uh, in pretty good shape. Only 5,000 Americans were chasing her at one time. <laughs> I would imagine she looks back on those as pretty good years. <laughs> she was she was really a wonderful gal. Uh, we would put all all of the airplanes we crashed at NKP. We'd pull the bent props and hang them around as a little garden ornament. You can see one of them there, but we must have had yep. 20 of them around the hobo hooch out there. And we call ourselves the Sun Deck Commandos because we'd go out and work on our tans between flying out there. We had to have a revetment. The Air Force said we did. Uh, we never had a rocket a tank, so we painted ours up so it looked just like an A-1. We put a prop in a canopy. And we started putting the tail numbers of airplanes that were lost, but after a while we ran out of place to paint the tail numbers, so we ran out of doing that. Okay. My last mission, November 1971. 161 combat missions, 608 combat hours. There I am in my party suit. I'd had enough. Okay. The Jolly Green Giants, who were our great friends and partners, uh, had a tradition. They'd pull our skivvies down and they'd get some terrible bilious green paint and paint green footprints on our butt. And uh, they stayed there for about four months, as I recall. You know, pretty pretty hard to get green paint off of your off of yourself. And uh, that's what they did to celebrate uh, Sandy Pilot that had uh, survived and gone home. That's John Ralston, me, and uh, Jim Lowe in the picture. Okay, the last mission, and this is a story that Youngblood will tell in great detail. He does it uh, very well indeed. The last mission flown by A-1 Sky Raiders, well after we all went home, was basically about four years after Youngblood had flown the Sky Raider himself. 1975, Roger? Okay. What had happened when Saigon fell, as you recall? We didn't have any more Sky Raiders left. Nobody was flying them. Roger was in country flying uh, AU-23s as an instructor. He'd gone to Thai school and was teaching Thais to do that. Saigon fell, uh, all of Vietnam fell, and the Vietnamese pilots ran all of the airplanes out of there and flew them to Utapau, Thailand, many of them. At which time, Roger and another former A-1 pilot who was also there got the call from Heine Adderhold who said, go pick up those airplanes and take them from Utapau and take them to Tok Lee. And that's what Roger did, lash flights, and as a matter of fact, they saved four airplanes, two of them are sitting in that hangar right there. Oh, wow. 665 and 606 were saved by Roger Youngblood and Jack Drone. Okay. And there's a picture of that Youngblood actually took in flight of Drummond out there. A very historic picture. Okay. So the U.S. Air Force had 200 Sky Raiders that served in, uh, in Vietnam, a total of 200. 159 were lost, okay? The rest were given away over time to South Vietnam. So we quit flying the Sky Raider soon after I left when we ran out of them. I mean, it wasn't a fact that we thought they were old. We just got them all shot down, done. They were out of there. What year did you leave, John? I left in 71. And they went on, what, Bob, till about 73 early, maybe? We gave them away in November of 72. Oh, a one, when you, one year after I left, they were all gone. There's a, there's a great story, though, I'll tell you later about it. Eight of us ended up going back and taking them from the South Vietnamese various bases on a hand receipt and flying them up to Da Nang for a linebacker strike after we didn't have any airplanes. 
Amazing. So anyway, we a lot of people think that we quit flying Sky Raiders because they were old, not because we ran out of them, essentially. So I want you to think about this. One out of every five A1 pilots was shot down on his tour of duty. One out of every five. Now, happily, many of them were picked up and lived to fly another day, but that's what the statistics are. When you look at sorties, how many pilots, how many airplanes, so you had a one in five chance of pulling the handle and bailing out. This again is a list that was uh, that Hook had put together. U.S. Navy losses, U.S. Air Force losses. There are 106 names on there. There are comrades and friends, of people in the audience here. There were 700 U.S. Air Force pilots in general that flew it. We lost 106 pilots killed. That means you had a one in seven chance <coughs> as an A1 pilot in staying alive on your tour of duty over there. Okay. Now I think about that, and I think about it a lot in these years. And in my little airport that I run in Southern California, every Veterans Day, I have a huge Veterans Day event where I think about my fallen comrades and my friends. And it's there to do nothing but honor military service and veterans, and it means a great deal for me to do that. Now, I have four wonderful children. One is with me today, Mark, in the back. And what, Owen, run away? <laughs> he's okay. He's playing with something. That's a good boy. <laughs> uh, of my four, I have only one that became a pilot. It's daughter Mary. She's now a major in the Air Force Reserves and a KC-135 pilot. All the rest of them are highly successful and were raised in aviation. And I'm quite proud of my total brood here. Okay? Four kids, now nine grandkids. But I reflect on our comrades who never came home and don't have four kids and don't have nine grandkids. And it's a sobering thought for me in my 73rd year. And I very much appreciate it. And I can tell you that I am extremely proud of my family. It's the things that I'm proudest of. And the second thing that I'm proudest of is being a Vietnam combat veteran. Okay? Now I want to show you some ghostly pictures as I end here, and then I'm going to throw the floor open. These are some pictures of Laos today. This is the Ho Chi Minh Trail from a guy that rode down it on a dirt bike and took pictures. This is the actual trail as it looked about three years ago. Still no bridges, no roads low water crossings, no improvements at all in Laos. A Russian T-76 tank laying in the jungle. Okay. A massive bomb crater, which the caption says is now a fish farm. Wow. A T-28 shot down and wrecked in Savannah Cat. A boat made out of a drop tank. A Soviet bulldozer abandoned. The carcass of a CH-3 shot down in an AVF-4 Phantom. Yep. And the most poignant picture of all to me are these Leo tribesmen smoking and using as a hand rest an American fighter pilot's helmet. Okay. So to those that didn't come back, again, I give them my best fighter pilot salute, and I thank all of you for listening to the pitch. It was my great pleasure to speak to you. Thank you.